What's the crack? Big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDG, Big Dogs. Gotta eat. What do we got on tap today? What do we got on tap today? I don't know. I literally didn't write anything down. I have no agenda. I have no rhyme or reason, which is the case for most things in my life. But I figured I would, uh, this is pretty much the last video of the summer before week one goes into place and we're doing rankings and sit starts and all that bullshit. So I thought I would just sit and, and kick it with you guys for a little while and, and go through maybe some draft strategy, some things that have changed in my mind over the last few, uh, few seconds, few minutes, few hours, days, weeks, months, years, lifetimes in pertaining to your 2021 fantasy football draft. You know, we have our E-Town Get Down draft on Monday night, which is the biggest draft of the year for me and uh, my high school buddies. This is a league in which this will be our 13th year. We just did our draft order. The way we did our draft order this year was Snack set up uh, WWE 2K22. I don't know. Well, one of those fucking video games that he pays for every year. Wrestling video game. We did a Royal Rumble. Each person in the league, this is a 10-team league, super flex, half PPR. We switched to tight end premium this year, so everybody gets half PPR except tight ends get a full PPR. And the way we did the draft order, each person was represented by a wrestler in the Royal Rumble. It was completely randomized as to what order the wrestlers came out in, completely randomized as to their, you know, how good they were in the Royal Rumble. We can only use active wrestlers. So depending on where you finished in last year's league, Animal being 10th place, he got to choose his wrestler. For this year, his first pick was Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle not in the WWE anymore. And because of that, switches wrestler out, chose Randy Orton. We, as someone who's in, in my generation, I'm 29, uh, we got to live through the golden era of WWF. Stone Cold, The Rock, you know, those fucking ballers. And the way that we got around that was by choosing guys like Shane O'Mac, Jeff Hardy, Matt Hardy. Dudes that were were prime ballers when I was actually watching WWF. I used to go to WWF wrestling matches. One of my mom's good friends worked for uh, a company that had a box at... What is this? This is pissing me off. sticker worked for a company i want to say it was visa visa or eight no <laughs> avis avis like the car company they had a box at uh maybe madison square garden or maybe it was the meadowlands i don't remember one of those fucking stadiums nearby and uh they'd get the box the one that you would like it was a luxury box you'd go in there free food free drinks you know i was like 11 years old trying to rip off some margaritas had it in me back then they didn't let me have it though I had a lot of pent-up anger for them not letting me mix together a few limes, a country, whatever. Which is why I drink them all the time now. And uh, and we used to go to the matches, and they were like my favorite things to go to in the world. I was such a b big WWF fan. So I had to I had to relive my childhood. I chose Matt Hardy. My friend Jason told uh, chose Jeff Hardy, and I was like sick. Like they probably have some kinetic mind energy thing in the video game where they work together no matter what uh pretty sure his ass fucking knocked me out in the in the royal rumble actually come to think of it we streamed it on twitch and uh it was fantastic because it was it was randomized who started in the royal rumble but what was not randomized was actually never mind everything was fucking randomized Snacks was in the ring first with somebody else. Animal was Randy Orton. And 
Animals guy was like the sixth one to go. So basically it starts the Royal Rumble starts with two guys in the ring and then every 30 seconds or 60 seconds, a new guy runs out. Obviously, if you're tossed out of the ring, you're out of the Royal Rumble. Animals dude, Randy Orton, sprints into the ring. He's like the fifth guy in there. So there's 35 guys in there. I think one guy had been eliminated. So Animals guy goes in. He's excited, whatever. He's looking around. And then all of a sudden, he runs over to the to the rope, and he jumps over. So we're like, what the fuck is this guy doing? You know, is he about to, like, climb on top of the rope and, like, do a move? But no, he just stood there. He literally just stood on the other side of the rope, waiting to be fucking body kicked out of the ring. And that happened relatively quickly. It was amazing. Animals guy basically said, I saw your fantasy football season last year. And it was fucking miserable, and you don't deserve a damn thing in this ring. So I'm going to kick myself out. So Animals Guy, a randomized video game, ran over to the ring, to the rope, jumped over it, and then just got knocked the fuck out immediately, which is fantastic. My guy, Matt Hardy, was like the fourth or fifth guy into the ring, ended up finishing top three. It was incredible. He almost got he almost got kicked out like 22 times. Lo and behold, he's got the heart of the person who he's representing. So he survives. He ends up finishing third place. So I got my choice. Basically, whoever last man standing got his choice of the pick that he wanted. It was Larry Lunch. Uh, If you want to know more about any of these characters, I will link the vlog to last year's. um, I will link the vlog to last year's draft day down below. I don't like that. I've been trying to figure out why the lighting behind me is so dark. And I realized it's because I wore a white shirt. And it makes the background look fucked up. Actually, it doesn't look that bad because then all eyes are on me. Look at me. Look at it. Larry Lunch took the third overall pick. Interesting choice. Unless you know for sure who you like as RB3. If I have the choice of who I want, I'm probably going to take the one-on-one, take C-Mac, and not think about it. Because you can you could say anything that you fucking want about C Mac, like all these holes that you're trying to poke into it have counter arguments. Yeah, he was hurt last year. It's not a long lasting predictive injury. It was a high ankle sprain. You're over it by the next year. Alvin Kamara had one the year prior, it was the RB one last year. Christian McCaffrey had a high ankle sprain and then he had a shoulder injury. None of them are lasting into this year. He's healthy, he's good. If he had an ACL tear, an Achilles rupture, or something like that, I'd be a little bit nervous about it. I'm fucking not. Take the one-on-one. Don't think about it too hard. You have an elite player. Worry about the turn. When it's your turn. So he took the three. Jason, who was Jeff Hardy, we finished top three together. Shout out us. Took the one. Good boy. So he's going to take C-Mac. So I'm I'm sitting there and I'm saying, you know, lately I've been been, uh, starting to dabble with whether or not I want Dalvin Cook or Alvin Kamara at two. A lot of the research I've been doing on Cook, like we know we know Cook's got the upside of C-Mac. If Cook stays healthy for, healthy for the full year, um, he could, without a doubt, finish as the RB1 overall. 24 points per game, some shit like that. Irv Smith is now hurt, so it's even more of a condensed funnel in that offense. My concern is his shoulder. He continually dislocates his shoulder. And every time, it, we've seen it, like uh, Anthony Miller is a good case of this. Anthony Miller dislocated his shoulder, I believe, the summer of his rookie year. And he has not been the same, and he continues to re-dislocate it. When you dislocate that shoulder, the likelihood of you doing it again is very high. Uh, And it's like like you're just digging yourself deeper into it, right? It's like, uh, it happened, so you dig a little bit of a ditch. And you have to step into that ditch. And it's like you're trying to get six feet under, or you're trying to not get six feet under. But every time that you dislocate the shoulder, you're getting closer to it. And it's more likely that it happens, okay? So you dislocate your shoulder, and the next season, you have like a 30% chance of redoing that again. And then obviously, once that happens, it could fuck up your entire season. That is my concern with Dalvin Cook. So the injury risk is very, very real. It's not, I'm not guessing, we're not saying he's injury prone. This is scientific fucking factualities here. So I'm sitting here at the 102, and I'm I'm a little bit nervous that if I take Cook, he's going to be injured at some point. I'm going to get him for half a year. This is a super flex league. But it's a 10-team league, and it's a four-point-per-passing touchdown league. There's no bonuses or anything. The fact that it's a 10-team league tells me that 
I don't need to f- really, really go off about quarterbacks, right? I don't need to go off about grabbing Mahomes or Allen here, in my opinion. If it was six point per passing touchdown, maybe I would think about Mahomes here because I think he has a 55 passing touchdown season within his range of outcomes, and that's a league winner in a six point per passing touchdown league. I think because it's a 10 team league, and I've been in this league for long enough, we've been super flexed for long enough, I know that no matter what, like Justin Herbert, I'm pretty sure was a free agent at one point last year after like the first week. Um, There are always guys on the wire. Like Zach Wilson will probably be on the wire. Like those guys will be on the wire at one point or another. So quarterbacks aren't as scarce in this type of league, which means I want to get a running back. I just had another big money league last weekend, last Friday, where I had the 105 and I took Kamara. And I was happy about that. I'm really, really happy to post him up as my RB1 and not think a fucking twice thing about it. Which makes me think that I kind of have to go with Cook here. I, I, I've, to, I've said this many, many, many times. I do not like to double down on players. Especially when the stakes are this high. I want to diversify. I take Cook. I take Kamara. Very good chance that one of them, if not both of them, finishes top three backs. And I'm in the playoffs no matter what in one of those leagues. If I double down on one guy and it doesn't go well, we're fucked. Okay? And you could say, oh, if you double down and it goes well... Then you're in the playoffs, sure. But there are a lot of other moving moving pieces. I'm confident enough that uh, I can make things work if if one guy gets fucked, and I could I could build the team around other players. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I probably I'm probably gonna end up taking Dalvin Cook here. I'm assuming lunch will take Kamara at three. Last year, this league ripped off 14 straight running backs to start the draft. This was a super flex last year. I want to say Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes went off the board at like the 208, 209, 210 in that range, which is like a borderline where you were seeing them go in one quarterback leagues. So this league is very running back heavy. This league is very kind of fade quarterbacks, which I think I think they're not sharp dudes. Like they don't pay attention to fantasy shit all offseason, but I think they know the the key themes of where they need to be squeezing out the the value when it comes to like game theory and strategy in drafts. So I think we're going to have a start very much similar to last year where it's a ton of running backs off the rip. We'll see Devontae Adams probably go at the end of one. We'll see Kelsey go somewhere in the two. I do think at the 202, because this league tends to fade a lot of positional players like that, there's a good chance that I wouldn't typically get – like Devontae Adams could fall to me down at the 208. I know it sounds fucking insane. But it's possible in this league format. I don't think it'll happen, but I'd almost guarantee a guy like Tyree Kill or Stefan Diggs will fall to me there. I I'm gonna probably get my choice of like the quarterback two or three. I wouldn't be surprised if Kyler Murray or Josh Allen fell to me there. And then I definitely think it is tight end premium. And it being tight end premium, they get one point per PPR, everyone else gets half point per PPR. There's a really, really strong chance that. Maybe Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey could follow me at the 209. But Darren Waller will almost definitely be there at the 3-2. So that makes an interesting case. The thing with those guys is this. like People continue to jump up for those guys in tight end premium leagues. My whole strategy is basically based around the fact that like I don't want to draft wide receivers. You can continue hammering home like Travis Kelsey and Darren Waller would have been the wide receiver three or four last year, would have been the wide receiver two or three, whatever the case may be, that's fine. I don't give a fuck about having the wide receiver two or three on my team. That's the whole point I get across when I continue to fade tight ends. I do think, though, if it's tit for tat and I'm sitting there and I'm at the 209 and I say, hey, I don't really like any of the running backs off the ready, and Kelsey and Waller and Diggs and Hill are sitting there, I will end up taking the tight end. I don't really care for either position, the tight end or the wide receiver, to jump up into the premium rounds. I'd rather take running backs there. But if I'm going to side with one over the over the other, tight end makes a lot more sense because you do actually get the positional advantage because the points drop off. Tr- Once you get to like tight end eight or nine, they fucking stink at that position. Uh, the top end guys do score a lot of points. Same thing with the wide receivers. The top end guys will score a lot of points. The only thing is everybody scores points from like wide receiver eight to wide receiver 35 to 40, to 45, to 50. They all score points. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to use a premium pick on a position where 
the point per game difference between that guy and the guy you can get four rounds later is not wide. Whereas that is going to be the case at running back. That is going to be the case at tight end. So I'm debating, you know, I've done a lot of mocks and it's 10 team league. So you get a lot of better players falling to you there. I've done a lot of mocks where I've started off. Most of the places you can do mocks, whether it's fantasy pros, draft wizard, the sleeper app, any of those places that you do mocks, they go off of the ADP that they have up to that point. A lot of the times you have ADP kind of lagging behind on sites like that. So it gets a little twisted. Like I've done a lot of mocks where I can get like Dalvin Cook, Austin Eckler, Antonio Gibson. Don't think that's going to be the case. I don't think Austin Eckler or Antonio Gibson will be available. Knowing this league, I don't think they're going to be available at the 209. It's another important thing. Like knowing your league, knowing how your league drafts to prepare for your league. I don't think any of those guys are going to be there. I think a more realistic duo would be something like Dalvin Cook, Najee Harris, Joe Mixon. Dalvin Cook, Najee Harris, Clyde Albert Hilaire. I don't necessarily love that. And that's a spot where, you know, if like a Diggs or Kelsey or Waller are sitting there and I'm deciding between those guys and Clyde Albert Hilaire, I'm probably going to take those guys. I also think the way that a lot of the injuries that have kind of succumbed to the league recently, especially like, you know, the Cam Akers, J.K. Dobbins, Travis Etienne, they've opened up a lot of opportunity in the middle rounds for running backs, whereas I wasn't as comfortable about a month ago doing or saying something like that. So it's given me the opportunity, I think, to look a little bit more into the idea of opening up with one elite wide receiver, one elite tight end, and then filling the middle rounds of running backs with guys like, you know, once you hit the third, fourth round, like even if you took out the third round, like you could every once in a while, sometimes a 10 team league. So in the fourth round, there might be a David Montgomery, there might be a Chris Carson. But after that, you have all the Gus Edwards, Darrell Henderson's, Damian Harris, Trey Sermon, even guys I don't necessarily love, but like Javonta Williams, Chase Edmonds, all of these got James Robinson earlier on. Like those are realistically very good options at the running back position when you're at the end of round three, round four, five, six, seven. So you could re- you could start off. I could anchor my team with Dalvin Cook, grab some pass catchers in the middle or quarterbacks. Because again, this is super flex. So I'm trying to decide when do I grab my first quarterback. You know, if Kyler or Josh Allen or someone is sitting there at the three two, probably not going to pass up on them. I'll let them anchor my team along with Dalvin Cook, and then worry about a running back in round two as well, or later on a lot of good mid round options now, right? Like the dead zone this year looks a little bit different than it has in recent years. I do think there are a lot of players in the dead zone though, that we will look back on and be like, of course they were in the dead zone. There's no reason why we should have fucking drafted him there. Like uh, Mike Davis is a completely, I feel like he's a very easy running back to see right now, look back on next year and be like, I can't believe we were drafting him in the fourth or fifth round. The opportunity is there, but something in me just tells me, nah, no. Nah. Um, I also, I also think like tight end is not deep, but I think the middle round values are ones that you shouldn't be afraid of because you look at okay, so once you get rid of Kelsey Waller Kittle, if you don't get those guys, you're sitting at Hawkinson, where there's literally no target competition there. You can say DeAndre Swift, but he's a fucking running back. Like realistically, Swift, if he's lucky, will see 15% of the targets. That's at best like a wide receiver two or three type target share in an offense. They don't have wide receivers. They just let go of Rashad Perriman. I don't trust Tyrell Williams to stay healthy. I'm on Ross St. Brown is like running with the twos. Hawkinson might legitimately see 120 to 130 targets. He might score four or five touchdowns, but the reception numbers are going to be crazy. And then in a tight end premium league, like you got to love Hawkinson there. Look at Kyle Pitts. He's a rookie, but they also lose. Like the Lions lost legitimately like 320 targets this offseason. You might not think about it, but there are a lot of random pieces, right? Like Kenny Galladay's gone. Marvin Jones is gone. And sure, that takes up like 150 to 160. But there are a lot of like random guys that are also gone. A few of the running backs, you know, Adrian Peterson is gone. Any of the running backs that were there last year are gone besides Swift. Like even guys like Danny Mandola, 70 targets. Jamal Agnew, like 40 targets. Like shit like that adds up to 320 targets for the Lions. So you feel good about TJ Hawkinson. Uh, you can feel good enough about Kyle Pitts as long as you're not drafting him too early. Like Julio Jones is gone. He is clearly the weapon number two there. They're moving him all over the formation. 
Do I think he's going to go for a thousand yards? No, but do I think he's going to be a fine like tight end five, six, seven in that range? Sure. Mark Andrews, you're looking at Hollywood Brown hurt. You're looking at uh, Rashad Bateman hurt. So all these new weapons coming in, all of a sudden aren't really coming in anymore. So you have a, a, a J.K. Dobbins hurt, a guy that might have fought for pass catching work in the backfield, right? So you're looking at like the mid round of tight ends where they are not elite. But in previous years, like you didn't feel good about the middle rounds of tight ends. All of a sudden you got six. I love Robert Tunyon. I think there's no reason why he can't be like the weapon number two in this offense uh, behind Devontae Adams and be a real playmaker. So in there is probably a little bit more projection than the other six. But still, like I feel good. After that is where it starts to get messy. But if you can walk away with one of those top seven guys, I feel I feel pretty good at the tight end position. Like I you could like guys like Noah Fant and Goddard and Logan Thomas and, and all those types of guys. I'm not going to feel good with them in my starting lineup. Logan Thomas is a guy that I've come around to a little bit more, especially in a full PPR league for tight ends because he just gets a lot of volume. I don't think he's that great of a player, but I think he gets a lot of volume to the point where he could he could do some damage there. And uh, the wider the, the other thing about, about me thinking about running backs now and – how I'm I'm like semi okay with attacking rounds four, five, six, seven, eight with running backs. A lot of these guys are young, explosive, upside, pass catching guys, right? Like that's usually not what the dead zone is filled with. The dead zone is usually filled with shitty players like Fournette and Gurley and David Johnson and Le'Veon Bell and all of these like projected guys that are old past their prime or like two down grinders that uh, are not in good offenses that we think are just going to have great volume, like Mike Davis. Uh, this this year seems a lot different. We have a lot of high upside pass catchers in those middle rounds, whereas the wide receiver position feels like it tails off a little bit. And this might be my uh, experience in underdog talking, doing drafts on underdog.com. If you're not yet on underdogfantasy.com, you should probably sign up. The link will be the first thing in the description. Uh, best place to do some drafts to prep for your actual draft. The link will take you right to the App Store, iOS, Google, Android, whatever the fuck you're doing. It'll take you right there. Uh, these drafts are $3 a piece because you're actually competing in these drafts. Uh, if you if you come in the top three, you're going to win money. The best part about it is you don't actually have to do anything in season. So it's no extra work outside of the draft. So one, you get to actually prep for your draft in the best way possible because the leagues are $3 to buy into. So everyone is taking it super seriously. Two, you don't have to do waiver wire. You're not doing in-season trades, in-season anything. You're not doing sit starts. It automatically starts the best performing players at each position each week. So because these are really sharp drafts, one, you could do a ton of them before whenever you draft. So go to underdogfantasy.com, sign up. When you deposit $10 on there and you use the promo code BDGE, BDGE, you are going to get $25 free dollars on top of that, completely free on top of the $10 for using promo code BDGE. There you could rip off 10 drafts before you actually do your real draft. Get prepped. You'll know exactly where to take people. That being said, the, the, the ADP on there, the average draft position of players is so sharp I don't actually know if my mind is getting skewed or not. I think a lot of family and friends leagues will be using ADP that was more similar to like June ADP, where I got used to getting uh, eighth round Jerry Judy, ninth round Damian Harris. I don't think it's going to be that bad, but that's way more familiar to. I did a, a draft on Peter Overzet's channel this morning where we took uh, Judy at like the 5 4 and Damian Harris went off at the 5 5. And it's like that that that's been normalized in my mind to the point where I I need to step back and realize that's probably a bad fucking pick at this point. Right. Like, I don't think Jerry Judy should be a fifth round pick right now. Maybe you do. Maybe Teddy Bridgewater changes things for you. But I think it's a little bit crazy. I think like uh, I, I think what you can do is, is print out my rankings and then print out like ESPN's cheat sheet to get a, a good fixture of where different players are going. So it kind of relates to your league. And you can get my rankings in our draft guide, which is up on bdge.store. It's literally the only place you need to go to prep for your drafts. It's got the rankings for every league type. Uh, it's got our must draft players, our uh, bus, our all fade team, our sleepers and undervalued lists. It's got everything you need for your drafts up on bdge.store. And one of the things that we do on there is we put the season long ADP. And we take the season long ADP from both free websites, so like ESPN, CBS, and Yahoo. 
and then we compare it to ADP of paid leagues. So underdog, FFPC, best ball tens. And there, I think, is one of the more useful, underrated parts of the draft guide where you can actually see the difference between where guys are going. Like, you know what? I'm going to look it up right now. Let's hop the freak on there. And let's get a couple examples. Uh, we'll use, like, Jerry Judy because I just pulled him up and I talked about him for a little while. So under on BDGE.store, under the season-long guide, we go to ADP. And you will see a chart where it's got the player, the team, and then ADP of paid platforms, ADP on free platforms, and then the biggest differences of the two. So uh, the biggest differences are a lot of young players, obviously. So Diami Brown has an ADP of 227 on paid platforms, 342 on free platforms. You're going to see a lot of that with uh, rookies because on free platforms, a lot of people are less serious about fantasy. They don't actually know players and shit. All right. So we're going to just go to... I'm going to filter this by paid platforms, ADP. And we will find where Jerry Judy is. So Jerry Judy is up to pick 60 on paid platforms, which is 512. On free platforms, he is 21 spots lower, all the way down at 81. J uh, Jamar Chase is the next player on the board. Uh, ADP of 61 on paid platforms, ADP of 76 on free platforms. So that will give you an idea of where you should be drafting players. If you are like me and like, for instance, a running back, Josh Jacobs on paid platforms, he's 53 on free platforms. People still, you know, maybe not registering that Kenyon Drake is there, not really following the news, not realizing that he's probably a fade is going all the way up at pick 39. So there's a 13 spot difference, a whole more than a round difference for a guy like Josh Jacobs. So I think that gives you a better idea of where people who are sharp, who have been following fantasy all summer, are drafting players versus where non-serious leagues are drafting players. And that's probably where you can have the biggest advantage uh, in your leagues, depending on how sharp the league is for you. If you're playing in a league with you know, family that doesn't fucking pay attention to anything, their, their ADP is probably going to be closer to the free platform ADP on, on our draft guide on BDGE.store. Whereas you should probably take them maybe around earlier find a, a, a spot in the middle for a guy that you're really, really, really targeting. So yeah, you guys can go check that out on bdg.store. Um, yeah. All right. We're like 30 minutes into this fucking video already. I had no idea what I was going to talk about when I turned the camera on today. I just kind of wanted to sift through my, my recent thoughts of fantasy before I go into the town, get down draft on Monday night. I'm sure a lot of the questions that I will be getting for that draft Will it be live streamed? No, we will not be live at any point for that draft. We will film everything, of course, like we always do and make it into a fully fucking featured novel film, be in theaters. It'll be a full vlog, probably 45, 60, 75 minutes. Um, one of my favorite videos that we put out on our channel. So that will be in film, in theaters uh, at some point towards the end of the week. We film it Monday night. So whatever our turnaround time via our editors is, that's when that will be. That'll be filmed. Um, the loser punishment, I believe, what did we have as loser, loser punishment? We just decided what it was. Our, lo our loser punishment is, uh, whoever loses has to dress up in a tuxedo as a butler and they will be chauffeuring us around to, uh, a tailgate. That's probably going to be a giant's tailgate and they will be our, uh, they will be our butler both to and from the game and at the game. So I think it's, I don't know, it's kind of a pretty fucking lame one. It's, it's, it's a little bit of like public embarrassment. It's, it's more fun, but it's lame for content, in my opinion. I think we could have done something that's a little bit more intense, more content provoking, but it is what it be. This is a democracy. Every once in a while, I got to whip out the dick, dick, the dictatorship, dick. That didn't come out well. Every once in a while, we've got to whip out the dictatorship dick of Nick and flop it on a forehead or two. We didn't do it this time. Uh, it's a $500 buy-in league. The E-Town get down. The winner. Oh, next year. One one cool uh, rule that we have implemented is the World Cup rule. So for the World Cup, it comes every four years. And each of the first three years that are not the World Cup year, we take 10% of the buy-in and we put it aside. And on the fourth year, the World Cup rule is that that 10% of each year, which is a raising buy-in, like each year we actually raise the buy-in, so it's even more and more each year, goes to that World Cup pot. 
So like year one, I believe the, the buy-in was 400. Year two was 450. Year three was 500. So we take 10% of each of those buy-ins. So it's 400 times 10 people, 4,000. So we take 10% of that, which is, it, it would just be one buy-in because it's 10 people. So 10% of 10 people is fucking one person. 400, 450, 500. Those three numbers go into a side pot that go on top of whatever the year four pot is. So if we do another 500 buy-in next year, that's a $5,000 pot plus the 950 for 1450 we throw on top of it so it's a six thousand four hundred fifty dollar pot which will probably be broken up like four thousand to the winner two thousand to second place whatever uh so the world cup rule is cool put 10 percent aside for three years and then the fourth year is a world cup in which that person wins a fat pot uh what else do we have we're moving to sleeper for the first time this year tight end premium that's really it we'll be back at the law firm this year uh snacks aunt owns a law firm in which we get to use the entire floor, which is fucking cool. We'll have the confession cam. We'll have all, everything that y'all love. We'll be making margs. be making memories. be making mad, bad draft picks. Uh, that's all we got for today. I was going to do something clickbaity and, and dumb, but I just wanted to sit here, kick it with y'all. Thank you for hanging out for 30 minutes. Literally nobody hung out with me. I'm in my room recording to a fucking camera. Quite depressing. But I'm about to go live in about an hour, and then it is uh, Memorial Day weekend here in the city. And I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to... Uh, is it Friday right now? Is this video going up on Saturday? I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. I wasn't even supposed to make a video for Saturday because I'm going live for Q&A. Okay, well, by the time y'all watch this, I'm going live for Q&A Salt probably around 1 p.m. Eastern time. So go sign up on bdg.store for a membership or for the draft guide. I love y'all. I'll see you tomorrow five different times. Uh, but good luck in your drafts this weekend if you have them.